The service environment plays a major part in shaping customers' perception of the firm's image and positioning. As service quality is often difficult to assess, customers frequently use the service environment as an important quality signal. A well-designed service environment makes customers feel good and boosts their satisfaction and allows the firm to influence their behaviour while enhancing the productivity of the service operation. Numerous tactical decisions must be made when designing the organisation's environment. Individuals base perceptions of the organisation's services on sensory cues that exist in the organisation's environment. Specific tactical decisions must be made about the creation and sometimes the avoidance of scent appeals, sight appeals, sound appeals, touch appeals and taste appeals. The design and management of the organisation's sensory cues are critical to its long-term success. Sight. The sense of sight conveys more information to consumers than any other sense and therefore should be considered as the most important means available to service organisations when developing their atmosphere.
Sound. Sound appeals have three major roles, mood setter, attention grabber, and informer. Proactive methods for purposely inserting sound into the service encounter can be accomplished through music and announcements. Sound can also be a distraction to the consumer's experience. Consequently, sound avoidance tactics should also be considered. my pussy. He can't stay home without mummy, so I send my pussy to Sophisticat in Moravan. He gets his own spacious suite and personalised care and grooming, which is important, as he's a rather hairy cat. Sophisticat. Ask about special rates for new customers. Call 9555-1986 or check out sophisticat.com.au. Sophisticat. It's not a cattery, it's a pussy cat resort. Scent. The atmosphere of the firm can strongly be affected by scents and the service manager should be aware of this. When considering scent appeals, as was the case with sound appeals, service managers should pay as much attention to scent avoidance as to scent creation. Touch. Touch appeals associated with being able to touch a tangible product or physical evidence of a service, such as shaking hands with service providers. For pure services with small tangible co component, touch appeals can be developed through the use of open houses 
where the public has a chance to meet the people providing the service. This is common practice at schools and universities who run open days for parents and would-be students in their endeavours to attract the best students. Taste. Taste is a rather poorly developed sense. However, we compensate by using our other four senses to judge a product's quality. Some retailers offer their customers sweets at the cashier. Other more exclusive boutiques, such as Tiffany, await their shoppers with a glass of champagne to make the shopping experience more pleasurable. Sampling is a common technique for product launches in the food and beverage category. Giving the shopper a chance to try a product before actually buying it is still a widely applied marketing tool. Australians love to shop. Last year we spent $20 billion on it and this is our mecca, the modern shopping centre. So you're here to buy things, obviously, but there is a power over you in this space that you might not necessarily be aware of. See, everything about the design of this building is driving you to spend money, sometimes on things you don't even need. I'll take two. Architects have a way of creating spaces that subtly mess with our minds, making us more vulnerable to impulse buying. It's a practice called scripted disorientation and the moment it works on you is called the Gruen Transfer. 
There's a multi-billion dollar industry that thinks, plans, tests, observes and designs every inch of this place. And it all starts here, the entrance, the decompression zone. Now take a moment to look around. There's nothing to see, there's nothing to look at, there's nothing to buy. It's because they know that you need a few seconds to acclimatise when you come in the door to get into that proper money spending mode. Once you're into the mall proper, the disorientation techniques kick in. The most obvious things to look out for are number one, there are no clocks in here. Number two, you rarely ever see the outside world clearly from the inside. They're both classic methods for skewing your perception of time. Next, the lighting and colour schemes are both harsh and bright. The floor is tiled and reflective, which also means it's loud in here with that music and people talking and kids yelling. All of it designed to make you yearn for the relative comfort of a store. You probably turn right as soon as you enter, because that's what most people do. In fact, so many of us do it, they actually call it the invariant right. That's why all the bargain bins, specials and recommended books and DVDs are always here. It's so much nicer in here. The lighting is calmer, the music is quieter, the carpet is soft, like a baby zebra. It all makes you feel just a little bit more open to the idea of spending three grand on a flat screen TV. There's an enormous amount of investment that goes into designing shops. They're working with these sort of long evolved aspects of our behaviour and the way we understand the world in a way that most people are probably unaware of. The easiest place to spot these techniques in action is your local supermarket. Now what are the most bought items? You've got your bread, your milk and your meat, right? Supermarkets position them in totally different parts of the store, making you visit as many aisles as possible to complete even the simplest shopping list. The more products you pass, the more likely you are to impulse buy. Ooh, space food sticks. But the true grand wizard of consumer manipulation is without a doubt IKEA. IKEA intentionally confuse your sense of direction by making you focus on this maze. It takes you about half an hour to walk through the showroom and after about 15 minutes, you have no idea where you are. Before you can buy what you actually came in here looking for, you have to wander through these fantasy apartments. You see, IKEA wants you to interact not with individual products, but with combinations of products. The first things you can actually pick up and buy are these. Incredibly cheap glasses, plates and cups, and after seeing the expensive apartments, eh, there's no harm in picking them up. By the time you do get to the flat pack you came looking for, According to University College London, you've bought 60% more products than you ever intended. At the end of the day, probably the best thing for your wallet is to leave the shopping centre. You don't want to do that because wall designers have intentionally made that car park so bowel-clenchingly difficult to navigate that your subconscious is telling you that you would rather do anything than try and find where the hell you put the car.